Hello, my name's Stephen. This is Faith Ministries. 1500s was a time of great renaissance, or the beginning of the renaissance, and a time of reformation or reforming of the church. People of literary and scientific renown were people such as John Fox at the time. You may have heard of him. In his influential work of Fox's Book of Martyrs, which he wrote about the persecution of Protestants during the reign of Queen uh, Mary I, and it was a rallying cry for the Protestant cause. There are people like Thomas More or Sir Thomas More, a statesman, a philosopher, um, a guy who clashed with King Henry VIII over matters of religious reform, and he wrote works such as Utopia. And then uh, there were scientific people like Nicholas Copernicus, who was a Renaissance mathematician and astronomer who lived in Italy, formulated the heliocentric model of the universe, as we know today, where the sun is the center rather than the earth of our solar system. And then there was a guy called Andreas Vesalius, who was a, a Flemish anatomist or doctor, I suppose you'd call him today, a physician. And he wrote a book on the fabric of the human body, which revolutionized the study of human anatomy. Like several of the older Bibles, which we have looked at in the past, the Great Bible was published in 1539, which marked the first time an official version of the Bible was made available to the public in English. Let's just have a quick look at the chart of how those different Bibles relate to each other. So down at the bottom here, we see that we have the, the Tyndale's New Testament, which was published in 1525. Now, I've drawn lines on these. Some are, are a direct influence. Others are a slight influence. But coming out of Tyndale's New Testament in 1537, we had a Bible called the Matthew's Bible, which we've already looked at in 1537. Over here, in, also in 1577, we have the Coverdale Bible. And then influenced by, again, by the Tyndale Bible, again, by the Matthews Bible, we have the Great Bible, which we're looking at today in 1539. We've also looked at another time, the influence from Tyndale uh, at the Geneva Bible, which many of you find very interesting at the moment in 1560. And also one which we're going to have a look at in the future in 1568, the Bishop's Bible. And as you can see, it's had influence from Tyndale's New Testament and the Coverdale Bible and all of these have had some or great influence upon the Bible, which we know today as the King James Version, which was first published in 1611. So the Great Bible, 1539, first published. It was the first Bible permitted by King Henry VIII to be used in the newly established Church of England church services. A guy which we've already looked at before, who did the Coverdale Bible, as you know, and worked also on the Matthews Bible, was a guy called Miles Coverdale, who, under the commission of Thomas Cromwell, who was King Henry VIII's secretary and vicar general, oversaw its creation. In other words, uh, Cromwell was basically second in charge at the time. And Cromwell instructed the clergy to ensure that every church had a large English Bible accessible to the parishioners and therefore come the Great Bible. Now, although Coverdale and Matthew had translations of the Bible licensed by King Henry VIII, neither was fully accepted by the church. And so the churches, the Church of England didn't want those particular Bibles in their churches as the Bible for their church. But in 1538, Cromwell's injunctions made it mandatory for churches to own a Bible, which we think is Pretty amazing these days, isn't it? How could have a church without a Bible? But in those days, they had a lot of churches around which didn't have a particular, they had Latin Bibles, but they didn't have an English Bible. And so Cromwell, in junction, he passed a law that said, you must have an English Bible in your church. And so we know, as I show you there on, the, on that chart, that the great Bible, it borrowed heavily from the Tyndale Bible, but made revisions to remove objectionable material that they found at the time. Now, since Tyndale's Bible was incomplete, Coverdale, as we know in other videos we've looked at, he completed the translation by doing the remaining Old Testament books and also the Apocrypha using the Latin Vulgate, which was available at the time, but also German translations, rather than looking at the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic texts. Now, even though it's been named, known primarily as the Great Bible because of its size, it has also been known as the King's Bible which because it was authorized by King Henry VIII. It was known as the Cromwell Bible because it was under the direction of Thomas Cromwell. 
but it was also known, interestingly, as the chained Bible, because it was chained to the to the table or chained to a small area wherever it was in the actual church itself, so that people couldn't pick it up and run off with it and steal it and then sell it to somebody else or use the paper for some other means. The chained Bible. So the Great Bible, it played a significant role in the spread of the English Reformation and also the establishment of the Church of England. The last edition of the Great Bible was published in 1569 with over 30 editions released between 1539 and 1569, totaling more than 9,000 printed copies up until 1541. So it wasn't a, a million dollar seller, but had to have enough to go to all the various churches across England at the time. So Coverdale's failure to translate from the original languages eventually contributed to the development of the Bishop's Bible, which we'll have a look at in a future video. But with the Bishop's Bible uh, replacing the Great Bible as the authorized version of the Anglican in the Anglican Church in 1568. So let's just have a look at a, a photocopy of the, the Great Bible, some of the pages in it, and how it actually looked. So here, this is within the first few pages of the Great Bible. And here we see up the top here the names, the names of the books of the Bible. And as you can see, it is older English than what we're used to using at the moment. And it runs down here with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and they have it all laid out like this. And then we get to the, the first book, as it says up the top here, the first book of Moses called in the Hebrew Bereshith and in Latin Genesis. And so they have a nice little colored symbol there, photo of the word I, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so we have it like that. And so they have different comments down the side as well. And we go to another page, for example, they put in little pictures, etc., of Adam and Eve, and it was in two columns each page, and it went on like that throughout the entire Bible. So the question we can ask ourselves also is, did Coverdale have any problems writing and publishing the Great Bible? And the answer to that is yes, of course. At the time, there were a lot of challenges going on with the writing and publishing of it. One of the greatest challenges was to do with politics and the religious climate at the time. And even though King Henry VIII and Cromwell, they wanted an English Bible that they could put in the churches to promote the Church of England, there were still a lot of uh, religious authority, religious people, political authorities out there who did not like anything else besides the Latin Vulgate, who did not like anything else, being the Bible being written in another way as to other than what they knew about. And so there was, he faced a lot of scrutiny from these conservative factions within the churches who were resistant to change. But despite these cha challenges, the Great Bible was eventually published with the support of King Henry VIII. And as we know, it played a crucial role in shaping English religious identity. As you saw there in the example of what the uh, Great Bible looked like in print, the, Bible, the English that they used at the time was called Early Modern English. And this form of English was used during the 16th century when the Great Bible was translated and published. It retains some similarity, as you saw, to Middle English, but also exhibits a lot of features that are recognizable to us today and more on. So we are able to actually to read it, understand what is actually being said in it. It can seem somewhat archaic to a modern reader, but it does resemble more contemporary English. The Great Bible was great because of its size. It was basically 11 inches wide, if in inches, uh, I'm not sure what that is in centimeters, close to probably 28 inches or 30 centimeters wide, and up to 17, 18 inches, which is about 450 centimeters, uh, 45 centimeters, sorry. So it was almost 18 inches high, 18 inches. This is a standard one foot or 30 centimeter ruler. And it was half that length again, high, and it was that width wide. And I can imagine how thick it must have been. And it had clamps on it to close it up. It also had areas where it could actually be chained down. So it was a, a massive Bible. It was intended to be a pulpit Bible and changed, as I said earlier, to prevent its removal. 
A printer for the Bible was a guy called Edward Whitchurch. And so the Bible also goes called Whitchurch's Bible. So it's one of those few Bibles that has a lot of different monikers to go along with it. Uh, the trouble with the Great Bible was that it wasn't like the King James, that it was mass produced, could go to people's homes, you could read it in private in your own home to your children, etc. But it was a Bible that had to be kept in the church and therefore it wasn't could not be taken home or used for personal study. But as we know that the reformers dream of putting the word of God in every person's hand wouldn't come until later with Bibles such as the Geneva Bible, uh, Martin Luther's Bibles in his, in his German translation, etc. Getting it out of the Vulgate, putting it into a form that people could read. Let's just have a look at a particular page. It's an interesting, uh, interesting article here on the internet by a guy called Stuart Palmer from the Centre for Medieval and Early Modern Studies at the University of Kent. Let's just have a look at that. So here on this particular page, we can see that this article by him, the Great Bible, a Gospel according to Henry VIII. And he goes on to look at the, uh, basically the inside front cover here, or inside page, uh, which was, they called it a, um, a woodcut, a woodcut. They used to have woodcuts, they'd carve them and then they'd uh, put the ink onto the pages. And he brings out interesting points here that basically it was an unmissable opportunity by King Henry VIII and Cromwell to not only promote the, uh, the great Bible, but also promote himself as King of England and how great he was. And if you have a look here on this particular page, he brings out the point that this is King Henry VIII in the middle. It's not God. He's got all these people around him who are serving him. Uh, you've got other different factions. You've got the uh, like the, bishop, the bishop, bishops down bottom here, etc. But basically, the beginning of the Bible is that it's almost like a King Henry VIII's Bible. He is the center of it. And then down here in the bottom of this particular rest of the page, we see in the right-hand corner here, that there is like a little prison. So if you disagreed with King Henry VIII, like some of his wives did, you ended up in prison. Uh, you had to agree, you had to go along with what they were doing as far as mandating and putting the particular English Bible in the church. There were also, at the time, a lot of the people, more of um, conservative people, more Protestant people, um, were not all impressed with the, uh, with the Church of England. Uh, denomination that was being formed by King Henry VIII. It was a breakaway from the Pope because of his marriage issues, etc., the Catholic Church. And um, But they didn't really see the Great Bible as being a Protestant Bible because a lot of them didn't see the Church of England as a Protestant denomination. They just saw it as another schism from the Roman Catholics. King Henry VIII, again, basically promoted himself to be Pope over the Church and so they, a lot of them didn't want to have anything to do with it. Therefore, there was still a lot of persecution happening. Uh, you end up with a lot of uh, a lot of the reformers wanting to have the Bible in English, and of the development of Lutheran uh, denominations, other denominations like Quakers, etc., that got formed because they didn't particularly perceive the United Church of England as being a clear breakaway from the Roman Catholic at the time. But as you know, the Church of England is part of one of the cornerstone churches, the Protestant churches in English uh, countries today, along with Baptists and Presbyterians, and Methodists and Pentecostals, etc. So there you have it. That is the Great Bible. Great in size, great in influence, great in the effect upon the people and the reformation of the, the church at the time. Hope you enjoyed that short video about it and hope you learned something new. If you like the video, please like and subscribe so more people may see it. And until next time, God bless.